So I wrote a book called The Ends of the World, Volcanic Apocalypses, Lethal Oceans, and Our Quest to Understand Earth's Past Mass Extinctions, which is kind of a mouthful. Um, but this talk and the book is about uh, the science behind the worst mass extinctions in Earth's history. So just give you a little context for what we're talking about. Um, the Earth is 4.5 billion years old, um, and we're really only concerned with the last uh, half billion years or so, so kind of just recent history. Um, and the reason why we're only concerned about the last half billion years is because this is really the age of what we think of as complex life or animal life. Um, before this, um, some cool stuff does happen. At the beginning, there's this thing called the late heavy bombardment where the Earth's just getting pelted by giant asteroids. Around 2.5 billion years ago, there's the great oxygenation event when suddenly oxygen becomes an appreciable part of the Earth's atmosphere and kind of underwrites all the complex life afterwards. Um, right before uh, the age of animal life, there's this crazy period of life on Earth called snowball Earth, where the Earth goes in and out of these sort of global glaci glaciations that you know, froze the planet almost solid to the tropics. Um, on the other hand, from 1.8 billion years ago to 800 million years ago, there's uh, a period that's so uneventful that it's called the boring billion. And it's called that by geologists, so that really says something. <laughs> um, so a much better visualization for this, I just want an excuse to show this picture, because I love this picture. Um, but the, we're really talking about the top part of the spiral here when there's things like dinosaurs and uh, trilobites and fish and things like that. And all those spirals back to the beginning is sort of the boring billions I was just making fun of. But So we'll zoom in on the last 500 million years. Um, there have been five times in the last 500 million years when more than 75% of life on Earth goes extinct in what geologically is a brief period of time. So this is on the order of thousands to tens of thousands of years, which sounds like a long time to us, but geologically that is like an eye blink. So we'll just dive right in. The first one of these is 445 million years ago. It's the end Ordovician mass extinction. Um, this is an, still an unbelievably long time ago. This is hundreds of millions of years before dinosaurs or Pangaea or anything like that. Um, the, the planet would have looked completely alien and unrecognizable, and here's some evidence for that. Um, so you can squint at this all day, but I don't expect you'll be able to really orient yourself. But just to help out a little bit, that one of these floating islands, the one that's sort of the, to the west, that's North America. It's mostly south of the equator, rotated about 90 degrees, and it's covered by, it's mostly underwater too. Um, and sort of the Earth is covered with a lot of these shallow seas. Um, and the, the, there's a supercontinent that's slowly drifting over the South Pole called Gondwana, which is made up of Africa, South America, Australia, Antarctica, India, Saudi Arabia. Um, and interestingly, this little island chain that's sort of down there that's, I don't know if you can see it, but that's actually eastern New England and the Canadian Maritimes that in about 70 million years is going to crash into North America. So this is a totally different planet. You'll see that the color of the continents is kind of this dull grayish brown, and that's because um, the on land was basically a barren wasteland. Uh, there's no trees. Um, there's hardly any plants at all. The ones that do exist are sort of weeds around lake margins and stuff. But for the most part, if you went and visited the land in the Ordovician, it sort of would have looked like what you see from the Mars Curiosity rover. It just would have been a desolate place. Um, but there is tons of animal life, and it's under the, it's under the waves. Um, like I said, there's a lot of these shallow seas. Sea levels are hundreds of feet taller than they are today, so um, the continents are flooded with these shallow seas. And this is a terrible picture that I took, but this is from Cincinnati. Um, and if you drive around Cincinnati, it's amazing. You, you see just this gray stratified rock, and if you go up and look at it, it's just filled with seashells and fossils. And this is from almost a half billion years ago. Um, this is one of the most fossil-rich regions in the world, and it's one of the best examples of Ordovician sea life. And the fossils you find are from things that look like this. So this is a painting of what life would have looked like in North America um, in these shallow seas. And so it's known as the sea without fish which is something of an overstatement. There are fish. They're sort of these like jawless weirdos. There's one right there in the foreground. Um, but ecologically, they're not that important. And the world is really dominated by things without backbones, uh, invertebrates. So it's sort of like a world of creepy crawlies, almost. Um, you have these things that look like horseshoe crabs, kind of trilobites. There's one of those. And then the, these big dominant predators are uh, cephalopod nautiloid, or nautiloid cephalopods, which are kind of these squid-like things that are uh, stuffed into these giant ice cream cones. And they would have eaten trilobites and all sorts of other stuff. Um, so this is the Ordovician world. It's a very alien world. And at the end of the Ordovician, the shallow seas where a lot of these things um, lived basically disappeared because you suddenly go into this huge ice age, and the sea level drops by hundreds of feet. You destroy all this habitat on top of the continents. Um, 
but even things in the deep go extinct, and that might be because the ice age changed the circulation of the ocean and changed the oxygenation. And so you're destroying a lot of habitat. Uh, things get pretty bleak. Um, the reason why you go into an ice age is thought is that CO2 was sort of dwindling over the Ordovician um, to the point where when it, it reached this threshold, where then you go into this huge ice age. Uh, today we're worried about CO2 going up too fast and it getting really warm, but if the opposite thing happens, you know, it can get very cold. Um, the reasons why CO2 is declining are debated, but one of the ideas is that, you can't really see it here, but the Appalachians are starting to form. Um, they would have been this huge volcanic mountain range in the tropics that would have been eroding really fast, and for some reasons we don't have to get into, that would be a really good way of sequestering a lot of CO2. So this is kind of a weird extinction. It doesn't really have much to do with the other ones. Um, so then we'll just uh, jump forward about 70 million years to the late Devonian mass extinction when three quarters of life goes extinct. The Devonian's an interesting time because it's actually, there's a period of about 15 to 20 million years where you have just pulses of extinction, where the ocean seems to keep losing its oxygen for some reason. Um, but, so, as I said, it's, a really, it's, a, it's also a really transitional period for life on Earth. Um, as I said before, in the Ordovician, there wasn't much plant life, there were no trees. In the Devonian, suddenly plant life is sort of taking off. Trees suddenly evolve and they're sort of invading the continents. Interestingly, the first fossil trees or forests that we know of on the planet were found in upstate New York uh, when they were quarrying a dam to make a New York City reservoir. It's this thing called the Gilboa Fossil Forest, but today you can't go there because it's behind the protection of the State Department of Enti Environmental Protection, so it's kind of a bummer. But um, the Ordovician was a sea without fish. By the late Devonian, we're now in this period called the Age of Fishes. Um, there's this huge array of really bizarre fishes. Um, this thing is a placoderm, which there are other placoderms that look totally different, but this one was sort of the top predator. It had this sort of guillotine-like mouth, kind of a crazy, uh, scary animal. Th these things have actually been invoked for why our fish ancestors decided to come onto land. Basically, they were terrified of things that look like this. Um, and then, so also in the oceans, you have the largest coral reefs in the history of life on Earth. They would have been 10 times the extent of modern coral reefs. And in the late Devonian extinction, um, 99.99% of them disappear. These things get hammered. Um, it's a really bleak time. And like I said, anoxia, the ocean losing its oxygen, is thought to be one of the big kill mechanisms for this extinction. And it's, a similar thing happens in our world today. Um, so I don't know if you guys saw this, but earlier this summer, the largest dead zone ever in the Gulf of Mexico was measured. Um, this is sort of a seasonal phenomenon in the summer when um, the Gulf of Mexico basically loses its oxygen over a huge area, and it's horrible for fishermen. Uh, you have these sort of tides wash in all these dead fish in the Gulf Coast. Um, and the reason why this happens is because in the middle of the country, when we spread, in industrial agriculture, when we spread fertilizer on our crops, rich in nitrogen and phosphorus, it washes into the Mississippi and then out into the Gulf of Mexico where it uh, fuels these huge plankton blooms that when they die, they take up all the oxygen in the water and sort of kill everything else. Um, so something like this is going on in the Devonian, um, only on a much larger scale. And since there's no industrial agriculture that we know of going on in the Devonian, um, one of the uh, reasons invoked for this is actually that it might have been the trees themselves, which is, it, it's kind of interesting that one of the things trees do is they, they break down rock um, and they create soils. And when you have trees just suddenly invading the continents, they would have been breaking down a ton of rock, creating a ton of soils, and sort of liberating all these things like phosphorus that we spread on our crops today would have washed into rivers and then out into the oceans and might have caused these huge anoxic events. Um, and when the oceans went anoxic and all these things died, they fell to the bottom of the ocean and over hundreds of millions of years became black shale. And this is actually the stuff we frack today. This is from Lake Erie. There's exposures to some, some of this black shale. But a lot of the stuff that we've been fracking in the last few years is sort of dead sea life from the Devonian mass extinctions, which is kind of interesting. And actually, the extinction itself is in this picture. It's, it's, well, it's, it's in there, but <laughs> it's one of those boundaries. OK, so more than 100 million years later, we have the end Permian mass extinction. This is the worst thing that has ever happened in the history of life on Earth. This is kind of the all is lost moment for planet Earth. Um, something like 90 to 96% of species go extinct. Uh, coral reefs have recovered at this point, but at the end Permian, they are totally destroyed and basically replaced by bacterial slime. 
of the sort that you don't really see in the fossil record since before there was animal life, but suddenly it kind of shows up all over the place in the Permian. Um, in the fossil record, you see things like, um, there's sort of these weird things that look like fungal spores right at the extinction all over the planet, and people have said that maybe this is sort of a signature of things just like rotting everywhere. Um, trees disappear from the fossil record for, or we can't find them for maybe 10 million years after this. It's incredibly bleak. Um, and so, but this is the setting that it took place in. We're now in Pangaea, which um, I'm sure some of you have heard of. It's this time when all the continents were united in sort of this big C-shaped um, thing. And so North America is dashed to Africa, and there's South America, and Asia's kind of up there. You can see it's kind of deserty and bleak in some parts, and in the continental interior of Pangaea might have gotten really extreme. There's evidence from Kansas that parts of the interior of the continent was like 160 degree, degrees Fahrenheit or something like that. But there are places where life is happy, and at the end of the Permian, we have this sort of happy ecosystem that doesn't know that the end of the world's coming. But um, on land, the top predator are things that look like this. This is a cool artist representation of a, a therapsid, um, which was sort of the uh, uh, predator lineage of this larger group of animals called synapses. So these also, some of these look like big rhinoceros sort of things with tusks. And um, there were also these big warty reptiles. And this picture actually makes this guy look kind of cool. But you look at other representations of animals from this period, and it, it's not really the most photogenic time for planet Earth. Um, and then in the oceans, this is a picture of the ocean from the Permian. This is the Guadalupe mountain range in West Texas, um, which if you hike it and you look at the rocks you're stepping on, you can see that it's basically just made out of a giant reef. Um, the whole thing's basically fossils. Um, and it gives one of the best examples of um, what life was like in the oceans in the Permian. And if you go to the Permian Basin Petroleum Museum in Midland, Texas, like I did, uh, you can see this cool display of what these reefs would have looked like. Um, and because sea life was very happy in Texas, in the Permian, uh, eventually that died and was buried and much later made some people very rich and powerful. And in the Permian Basin Petroleum Museum has a hall of fame there that includes two of our presidents, which is kind of cool. Um, anyways, uh, so for a long time, people wanted to, I mean, obviously people were, one, were curious why did Earth almost go extinct at the Permian? And um, knowing that a huge asteroid is associated with the later extinction of the dinosaurs, which I'll get to, um, geologists aware of that came to this extinction, other early extinctions, looking for evidence of asteroid impacts in the fossil record. Things like, um, you know, a crater big enough to account for all the devastation or a layer of asteroid dust um, in the fossil record. And they couldn't find it, um, which came as kind of a surprise. And, but what they did find is that this huge area of Russia that's outlined here um, is known as the Siberian Traps, and it's basically all entirely made out of ancient lava. And when it was dated, it dates precisely to the Permian mass extinction. Here's actually a picture from, from you guys of what this area looks like. And you can see the sort of dull uh, brown sort of stuff is basically just ancient lava. Um, and if you go there, which I haven't, but this is what it looks like. It's just kind of these sweeping plateaus of um, ancient lava. Enough lava erupted at the end of the Permian that it could have covered the lower 48 United States a kilometer deep, um, which is just mind blowing. Um, people talk about Yellowstone as sort of this apocalyptic thing, but if Yellowstone went off, it would cover um, a, a few states and a few inches of ash, and enough lava here erupted to cover the whole United States a kilometer deep. So this really is a, a truly outrageous event. Um, this might be something what it looked like. These are fissure eruptions. Um, but since, as extreme as it was, it really only covered part of Russia. So that can really explain why almost everything on the planet goes extinct, even if it's on the other side of the world. And so geologists actually think that it was the gases that came out of these volcanoes that were the, the kill mechanism for most life on Earth. And the most important of those um, gases would have been, or it's argued, it would have been carbon dioxide. Uh, we know the volcanoes would have been capable of producing incredible amounts of carbon dioxide, and you can see signatures of that in the rocks. And it gets incredibly hot uh, at the mass extinction. One paleontologist told me that oceans in the tropics would have been the t uh, temperature of hot soup. Um, and when uh, seawater reacts with carbon dioxide, it makes it more acidic and it makes it harder for things that calcify, their, like build their skeletons to stick around. And so uh, carbon ocean acidification is thought to be a major kill mechanism in this mass extinction too. So those reefs I showed you totally disappear. Um, this guy totally disappears. Um, 
Interestingly, he is on our side of the family tree. These things are called mammal-like reptiles. So something in this, in this branch eventually becomes mammals, um, but these, these guys all get wiped out. Uh, but our, our ancestor must have made it through or else we wouldn't be here. And it might have looked like something like this weaselly little guy called Thrinaxodon, um, which somehow makes it through this extinction. So that's the end Permian. Um, amazingly, in the next you know, tens of millions of years, life recovers. And 25 million years later, dinosaurs evolve, true mammals come around, uh, crocodile ancestors come around, and uh, coral reefs bounce back. But then 50 million years later, basically the exact same thing happens at the end Triassic. 80% um, of species go extinct. And it's basically the same thing, just sort of a mini version of the end Permian. There's, uh, the Earth sort of opens up, and there's another one of these crazy volcanic events. So this is the slide for the Permian, but the world wouldn't have looked that much different, except for the fact that North America would have started to be pulling away from Africa. And you would get this uh, system of rift valley lakes there. And here's a picture of one. This is in Connecticut, actually. Uh, about 210 million years ago. And you can see there are dinosaurs now, um, but dinosaurs actually are not the dominant animal on, in the world at this point. Um, it's actually this branch of crocodile relatives. So you can, see, you can see one of them here, and some of them would have looked like things we'd recognize as crocodiles, but some of these animals are really strange. Some were um, plant eaters that ran around on two legs. And so it's, there's this whole kind of weird world of crocodiles uh, relatives. Um, and here's one called the Carolina Butcher that they found a year or two ago outside of Raleigh, North Carolina. Um, so you can see how these things sort of would have been the dominant um, animal on the planet. And the dinosaurs really needed these things to get wiped out in a mass extinction to take over in the next age. So this is, an, this is another picture of the ocean. Uh, this is the Australian Alps, which are, almost, which are in large part made out of coral reefs from the um, Triassic. Modern coral reefs evolve and sort of have this huge blossoming, but then are totally wiped out in the mass extinction. You can't really find corals for hundreds of thousands to millions of years after this extinction. Um, and so for a, long, for a decade or two ago, people thought they knew what sort of um, killed everything. And it, is, it was this crater that's in Quebec, which is about 62 miles wide. This is another picture I took from Google Maps. If you just go sort of a little northwest of Maine over the St. Lawrence River, you'll find this giant circular system of lakes. Um, and people knew it was around the time of the extinction. The problem is the Triassic mass extinction was 201 million years old or years ago, and when they dated this, they found it was 214 million years old. So this kind of came as a surprise because it seems like this massive asteroid hit that had been calculated should kill at least a third of life on Earth struck during a period when it seems like life was pretty happy and not at the time of the mass extinction. So this kind of came as a surprise to geologists who um, it sort of made them you know, rethink just how deadly asteroids have been in Earth history. Uh, this is a picture from on top of what actually was the kill mechanism of the Triassic mass extinction. So that's us in the background. But this picture is from on top of the New Jersey Palisades, um, just over the George Washington Bridge. And the New Jersey Palisades are just like the Siberian Traps, this huge expanse of ancient magma. Um, these would have been underground, but they would have been feeding eruptions in uh, New Jersey to the west. But you can find uh, the same rock dated to the exact same time in Nova Scotia, Brazil, Spain, Morocco. And it all comes out right at the, at the Triassic mass extinction. So it's another one of these insane volcanic events. Um, would have covered 3 million square miles in lava. But again, it's thought that these gases that came out of it really did, the, did in life. 135 million years later, we have the most famous mass extinction ever. Um, this the Cretaceous is the one that everyone's familiar with. Uh, 66 million years ago, um, all the non-bird dinosaurs go extinct. Um, we still have bird dinosaurs around. Um, but all these iconic species that people know about, like T-Rex and Triceratops, all are, are, are there at doomsday. And sort of all the big dinosaurs go extinct. But it's not just dinosaurs. There's tons of other cool stuff on the planet that goes extinct. This is actually also the biggest mass extinction in the history of mammals. Um, they, they make it through, but it also nothing really escapes the, the sort of sky of extinction here. Um, in the ocean, uh, these, this, this is an artist's rendition of an ammonite. Things like this have been swimming in the ocean for 300 million years, and all of them disappear at this extinction. Um, we also have these sort of giant, terrifying marine reptiles. This is like a, this is a pic picture of a mosasaur skeleton. People think of these as sort of aquatic dinosaurs, but these were evolved on a different lineage. They evolved out of things that look like monitor lizards or snakes. Um, 
And similarly, you have uh, pterosaurs, these crazy giant flying reptiles that also aren't dinosaurs, but you can see here some of them got to be the size of like small planes. Um, and those all go extinct too. So lots of cool stuff goes extinct. This extinction, I think, has produced the, the best paleo art, in my opinion. Um, this is a painting of a T-Rex literally staring down the asteroid, um, which is pretty epic. And um, in this picture, you see some pterosaurs flying by what must be uh, the Yucatan Peninsula. Um, but this, this, uh, this painting might actually, it, this might have actually sort of been an impossible scene, because I asked an impact modeler uh, what it would have looked like if you had seen the impact, and he said, that the question didn't really make sense because uh, if you were close enough to see the impact, you'd be dead instantly, basically. You'd just be set on fire and you'd go blind because there's so much energy released in the optical wavelength. So it was a really pretty extreme event. And the, the reason why we know there was an asteroid impact is that in 1980, uh, Walter Alvarez and his dad, Louis Alvarez, at UC Berkeley announced in a paper that they had found essentially a layer of asteroid dust between more or less the layers uh, between the age of dinosaurs and the age of mammals. And then a decade or so later, uh, paleontologists identified this 110-mile crater in the Yucatan Peninsula that's um, it's underground, so it's, that's, which is why it evaded them for so long. But um, it was actually found first in the 70s by geophysicists working for a Mexican oil company. Um, but, and it was found 1,000 years earlier, interestingly, by Mayan civilization, sort of unwittingly, because um, the impact structure has actually created all these limestone sinkholes that provide fresh water. And when Mayan civilization sort of sp sprouted up around this, uh, these freshwater sinkholes and un unwittingly sort of created this 110-mile ring that uh, marks the asteroid crater that killed the dinosaurs. Uh, I visited Mexico, and it's called the Chicxulub Crater because the epicenter is this coastal town called Chicxulub um, on the Yucatan Peninsula. Um, and I went there, and I would argue this is the most important event in the last 100 million years, and this is the only memorial to it, which is kind of sad. Um, the fly in the ointment of the asteroid uh, explanation for this mass extinction is that at the exact same time on the other side of the world in western India, you have another one of these completely uh, crazy volcanic events, a continental flood basalt, where this time, enough lava erupted to cover the lower 48 states in 600 feet deep of lava. So not quite the Siberian traps, but still a crazy amount of lava. And in the last few years, as people have gone back to date, this law, the, the Deccan traps, they're called, um, the most voluminous period of the eruption seems to be in closer and closer to the um, exact time of the mass extinction. So it's been really interesting to watch in the last few years as these sort of two communities that have always warred about whether the relative importance of the asteroid impact versus the volcanoes of sort of this more complex holistic picture of um, sort of an ecosystem going on for all sorts of horrible reasons um, is emerging. And so just to recap, uh, we know a giant asteroid hit at the end of the Cretaceous for one of these mass extinctions. As far as we can tell, we can't find evidence of a major impact at the end Triassic, the end Permian, the late Devonian, or the end Ordovician. On the other hand, um, there are major asteroid impacts at a time when Earth seems relatively happy. Uh, and then we do know that there were major volcanic events at the end Triassic, the end Permian. I didn't mention it, but uh, there is uh, another one of these big volcanic provinces that's been dated sometime around the late Devonian mass extinction. Um, it hasn't been dated precisely, but it's close enough to sort of certainly raise eyebrows. And then crazily enough, there's also one at the end Cretaceous. So this seems like these, this seems to be a theme of mass extinctions. And then we have an ice age in the end Ordovician and some weird stuff's going on with trees in the late Devonian. To summarize, these volcanoes would have wrought their destruction by extreme global warming. Uh, I don't expect anyone to understand this, but if you go to geology conferences, you'll see slides like this a lot where people have analyzed limestones and you can tell from the oxygen isotopes that it gets incredibly warm and you can tell from the carbon isotopes that there's a huge injection of light carbon that's driving the warming. Um, so this is for the Permian, it's, it's pretty unintelligible. but. So there's evidence of extreme global warming driven by CO2. And ocean acidification and ocean anoxia, um, which we see today, are thought, thought to be major kill mechanisms in these mass extinctions. Um, and this is concerning because modern oceans have become 30% more acidic since the Industrial Revolution. Uh, this is already affecting uh, shellfish growers in the Pacific Northwest are having trouble growing oysters around Antarctica and also in the Pacific Northwest, you see certain types of plankton are starting to dissolve because the water's becoming more acidic. There's less carbonate to build their skeletons. 
And by the end of the century, if we do anything like business as usual emissions, this stuff's going to get really grisly with coal reefs are expected to basically disappear by the end of the century. And anoxia, which is a major kill mechanism, as I explained in the Devonian, is also spreading in modern oceans from nutrient pollution from agriculture, but also warming makes it worse. Um, so as I said, are we in a sixth mass extinction? This is a question that people are talking about now. And I would say if we are in one, then it started a long time ago. Uh, there's sort of this eerie shadow that's followed humans as they enter new land masses over the last few tens of thousands of years. Um, where all the large animals sort of go extinct uh, where they are. So 50 to 60,000 years ago, people showed up in Australia. And shortly thereafter, you lose everything over 100 kilograms. You lose um, these giant wombats that would have been the size of cows and uh, marsupial lions and monitor lizards that would have been 15 to 20 feet long. Um, and then 12,000 years ago, around, um, we lose all, right around when humans are showing up in North America, we lose all of what we think of as ice age uh, fauna. Things like woolly mammoths, mastodons, camels, ground sloths, all sorts of crazy stuff. And then right up to the present day, in the past few centuries, as people have made these epic voyages across the Pacific to tiny islands, they've, um, uh, you know, you lose these big flightless birds and land snails and all sorts of stuff, to now modern industrial society, where really kind of have our foot on the gas. Um, this is a picture of an industri or a shrimp fishing boat. But um, industrial fishing, every year we bottom trawl, basically just plow over an area of the seafloor, twice the size of the continental US. And there's a picture of uh, uh, shrimp. what shrimp boats typically pull up, which is 90% of the stuff they pull up isn't shrimp. They, it's called bycatch, which is just other fish and sea turtles and stuff. And they pull out the shrimp. So there's huge waste in our, in our fishing techniques today. And we also deforest a ton of stuff. This is a satellite picture of the Amazon, where we've sort of made inroads and are breaking up habitat and things like that. So, so far, our interaction with the environment, to the extent that it's been negative, has really been through direct interaction. It's been through hunting and destroying habitat and things like that. And I think if we just sort of relented and let nature sort of go back, um, it, na nature's incredibly resilient. I think a lot of these ecosystems would bounce back, and um, we could avoid sort of the worst. The, the problem is that in the next few centuries, or next few decades to centuries, um, we're really going to start messing with the chemistry of the oceans in the atmosphere in a way that has only really happened a few times in the history of the planet. And when it has, it's been really pretty devastating. So this is what a healthy coral reef looks like. Um, but based on just sort of business as usual and even some aggressive uh, CO2 reduction scenarios, ocean acidification is thought to destroy most coral reefs in the second half of this century. Um, so this is what a high CO2, slightly warmer ocean looks like. This is probably what coral reefs look like at the end of the Permian. Um, as one ecologist put it, we're on a slippery slope to slime. Um, so that's, that's all the bad news. And that, it can seem pretty overwhelming and pretty depressing. The good news is that we still have tons of biodiversity to save. So earlier I said it, it might be debatable whether we're in a six mass extinction. And the reason is that so far, our best estimates is that less than 1% of species have gone extinct in the last few hundred years. Um, so when you compare that to an event like the Permian, when it's 90 96%, clearly we have a long way to go until we're in the same conversation as these worst events of all time. Uh, the bad news is that a lot of these animals, their populations are declining, and their range sizes are declining. And that's sort of the first step to extinction. And the best paper on this is by a paleontologist at UC Berkeley, Anthony Barnosky. Um, it's called, Has the Earth's Six Mass Extinction Arrived Yet? And his calculation was that if we keep up our influence on the environment for a few more centuries to millennia, we could actually be in the same conversation as um, the five worst mass extinctions of all time. So I think the good news is that the world hasn't ended yet, and we can still save it, and we still have time to do so. But we really have to act quickly. And it's crazy that we could ever even be in the same conversation as these completely crazy events when um, you know. And giant asteroids hitting at the same time as India is getting buried in lava and stuff. The fact that we're even in the same conversation is kind of amazing. Um, there's reasons to get discouraged based on sort of our political climate now, but I would, I would just say that it hasn't always been the case that conservation and environmentalism and kind of stewardship of the environment has been a partisan issue um, completely. Uh, I would just like to remind people that as recently as the George W. Bush administration, uh, this is a picture of his him signing. Uh, an act to protect the Northwest uh, Hawaiian Islands. 
And at the time, this was the largest marine protected area in the wor world. And hopefully we can start to, I don't know, think across party lines and agree that we're all here and share the same planet and that we should, we should uh, do our best to do so. Um, so are we in the sixth mass extinction yet? I would say we don't have to be, and there's still time to save the world. So let's go out and do that. And just to finish, here's a cool picture of New Mexico. And with that, thank you, Google. So we're just going to kick off with a few questions, and I'll open it up to you all. Um, so wow, interesting <laughs> stuff. And I like how you have some hope there, which is great. There's still time. So tell me, what was your initial inspiration for this book? I mean, what, what started the appeal to investigate all this? Um, well, there were a couple things. Uh, one was sort of just like any kid. I loved you know, Jurassic Park and stuff like that. And I've, I've always been obsessed with dinosaurs. And I've made a point to keep in, like, keep in touch with the extinction literature my whole life. So I, I've read Walter Alvarez wrote a book called T-Rex and the T Crater of Doom. And then uh, this other paleontologist, Peter Ward, wrote a book called Under a Green Sky. Um, and that was kind of the first time I'd heard that carbon dioxide might be involved with some of these other mass extinctions. But um, I was also writing a lot about the oceans. And when you write about the oceans, as you can see there at the end, it can get pretty depressing. Mm -hmm. um, and then I, I started to learn this story from uh, geologists that some of the changes that we're seeing today have actually happened in Earth's history, um, which to me was fascinating, because you kind of hear the story of climate change and what we're doing to the planet as something that's sort of simulated on computer models. And I thought this was so cool that um, the Earth's kind of run this experiment in sort of extreme ways. Um, and we can actually just go back and consult Earth history to find out uh, what happened. Um, and I also thought there was this sort of un, or not, it had been told, but I felt like the, the message could use some amplification, which is that in the public imagination, people associate mass extinctions with asteroids. Yeah. Um, that's partly because right after that crater was discovered, movies, horrible movies like Armageddon and Deep Impact came out. And so for most people, they kind of left it there. And they think, OK, mass extinctions are what happened when asteroids hit. And I had noticed that this cool conversation was going on in the geology community over the last few decades where we weren't able to find asteroids at the other mass extinctions. And it's actually some of the same mechanisms um, in operation on the planet today are what, what caused them. And so I thought there's sort of a news hook. And it's also just fun to write about dinosaurs and volcanoes and stuff like that. Nice. And thanks for speeding up time and taking us through the five mass extinctions. Of those, do you have a favorite? Uh, that changes. It kind of changes a lot. Okay. Uh, especially when I was writing the book. Every, every new extinction I would really focus on, I was like, this is the most mind-blowing thing I've ever read. <laughs> um, it, might be the, it might be the Permian, I guess, just because it was so extreme. Um, and it's, I guess it's kind of, it's, it's not really out there in the popular imagination um, the way it should be, just because it, it, it's really what happens when you turn all the dials up to their maximum level and try as hard as you can to kill everything on the planet. Um, so I don't know. This, it's also, it might be too extreme of a, it, it's kind of good news because even with the Permian, which I don't know if we're capable of reproducing, even if we do our worst, um, one paleontologist told me it was the best thing that's ever happened on Earth because 20 million years later you have dinosaurs and mammals and stuff like that. And sort of this new world blossoms afterwards. So for me, it was kind of amazing to sort of learn how resilient the planet is. Um, so yeah, I guess it's I guess it's the Permian. And when people say, "So what killed the dinosaurs?" I've heard you say they're not dead. Tell us about that. Yeah. So <laughs> as I said in the talk, that the bird dinosaurs are still around. Yeah. Um, and that's not a that's not just something cute that paleontologists say. Like birds are literally dinosaurs. If you look at a skeleton of a um, like a T. Rex and a chicken, compared to a T. Rex and a like Stegosaurus, you can yeah. see that the first two are way close closer cousins than. The latter two. Um, and even like if you have a chicken wing, you can see there's this little claw that comes up called a, I think it's called a lula or something. But there's actually still dinosaur claws. And that's its thumb from a dinosaur claw that eventually yeah. sort of evolved to become a wing. So when you look at a chicken in a chicken's eyes, you can tell it has this sort of like cold reptilian <laughs> like look. So I, don't, I, don't, I think it's kind of obvious that they're dinosaurs. <laughs> that's great. Yeah. 
All right, well, we want to open it up to the audience. I'm sure the rest of the, the Googlers have some questions. One thing that I was hoping you can touch a little bit on is towards the end of the book, you talk about um, when you start talking about humans and like the current state, yeah. you talk about how um, humans have culture and that's kind of what's tied into like why we're so destructive. The idea of like propagating information and ways of like, I guess, going about like destroying things in the earth. And I was wondering if you can touch a little yeah, bit on that. Yeah, right. Um, so a lot of people, a lot of times people ask me like, so when are humans going extinct? And um, a lot of paleontologists would tell you that humans are incredibly existent, extinction resistant, um, and that's because we have culture um, where other animals sort of have to wait around for natural selection to kill them off, um, and their information is sort of passed through to the next generation haphazardly by whichever part of the population is suited to the new environment. Humans can adapt on the fly by transmitting information through language and um, through books and things like that. And, uh, we can kind of get one step ahead of evolution. So that has enabled us to uh, rapidly take over the planet and uh, cure diseases and all these things that would have, like, we don't get killed by lions that much anymore. Uh, all these things that would sort of take out other animals, we can adapt to on the fly because we have this incredibly uh, adaptive, malleable information transmission system that is much more powerful, you could argue, than natural selection. So I don't know if that's. No, thank you. Right. Um, hi. Um, in recent years, we learned about the, that we broke the limit of CO2 in the atmosphere, the 400 parts per million. Yeah. And it's considered kind of like a break line, yeah. and that it might lead to what is called a cascade effect by the defrosting of Siberia and more methane being released yeah. and so on and so forth. Um, is that actually a deadline? Is Or are we going to see something like that in the next coming um, thousand years? So I know there there has been this fear for a long time that we could destabilize these huge reservoirs of methane and kick off this like completely catastrophic warming um, within a few decades. I think the more people have looked into that, it doesn't seem like these huge reserves are capable of sort of a catastrophic destabilization, but certainly over thousands of years, um, the Earth is going to get a lot war warmer than it is today. Uh, we know that the main driver of climate for the last 60 million years or so is the atmospheric concentration of carbon dioxide. And the last time it was 400 parts per million um, was the, I think it was the Pliocene. Um, but we're expected when sea level was, I don't know, it's like 30 meters or something higher than it is today. Uh, so over thousands of years, ice is going to keep melting and sea level is going to go up and we're going to transition to this much warmer world. Um, whether or not it will take place on a short enough time scale that will be catastrophic to civilization, I think is still an open question. Um, but we're headed towards, uh, people talk about it could be five degrees warmer um, by the end of the century and you think, okay, five degrees, well, that's not that big of a deal. Last time it was five degrees warmer, there was no ice in on Antarctica, um, or at least in times in the past when it's been five degrees warmer, there's no ice in Antarctica. And we're talking about going to th over a thousand parts per million CO2, and that brings you back to like the Eocene when there were um, palm trees in Alaska and stuff like that. And so maybe in a few centuries to millennia, we might actually recreate that world. But I think the next few centuries, or I mean the next few decades, there's going to be it'll get warmer. And sea level will go up, but I, I don't know if it will be quite on a catastrophic. I mean, it will be. It could be. It will be catastrophic, but Antarctica is not going to melt completely tomorrow. So. Thank you. I was wondering. So, if 86 or 90 percent of uh, animals go extinct, so that, that's not 100 percent. So, what are the retreats for those uh, little creatures that kind of survive? Did they yeah. kind of settle on mountaintops, or where did they go? Yeah. So there's these theorize things called refugia, um, where animals sort of wait it out until conditions get better and then they can flourish again. But that's sort of just a, a name that we've given to a phenomenon we don't understand quite. It's sort of like dark matter. It's like a placeholder, because for the most part, we don't really know where the refugia are. But it's easy to make life really miserable on certain parts of the planet, but it's very hard to wipe out you know, everything in every deep sea canyon and mountain valley everywhere on the planet and of every size. And, it's really hard to, to wipe out all of life on Earth, it seems, based on these mass extinctions.
I think it's in one of the Freakonomics books. They talk about these scientists who um, found that volcano eruptions bring down the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere and like serve to kind of cool the planet. Yeah, okay. and there was this group of people who were trying to make like these artificial volcanic eruptions yeah. in Antarctica. Um, and so how do you reconcile that with um, what you're saying right. before when you have these huge volcanic eruptions right. that bring so much CO2 into the atmosphere and leading to extreme heating? Right, you know? so that's a good question because there's probably, people use the word super volcano, it tends, tends to mean a few different things. Um, but yeah, explosive uh, sort of strato volcanoes that we see around the planet today inject a lot of sulfur aerosols that dim you know, it reduces the amount of sunlight that can come into the atmosphere, and it makes it cool, cooler temporarily. And that might have been a component, there might have been short-term cooling in some of these mass extinctions. Um, we don't see any evidence of that in the fossil record, and it seems to be swamped by this thousands and thousands of years of extreme warming. Um, but there might have been sort of cold snaps and things like that. What you're talking about with the geoengineering by shooting sulfur, or sulfate aerosols into the sky, um, so there's some scary studies on that, that if for any reason, we'd have to, if we started doing that, we'd have to keep doing it basically forever. Um, because if you stop a after a couple of years, the, the sulfur rains out and people who have modeled this, then in the meantime, if you keep building up carbon emissions while you're managing it by reducing the amount of sunlight, if that stuff rains out, suddenly warming spikes like crazy. In just a few years, you can jump up like four degrees or something like that. And that would be totally catastrophic. So when we're planning on how we're going to address warming, I'm not a huge fan of uh, that kind of geoengineering because it relies on um, sort of global international agreements that are perfectly enforced forever and based on, you know, I don't know, recent global geopolitics that prospect kind of frightens me. But that could have been a kill mechanism in, the, in these extinctions too, is that you have these sulfate aerosols that are blocking sunlight at the same time you're building carbon, and then when it gets rained out, suddenly you have these huge warming spikes. So uh, maybe we shouldn't try and recreate these like <laughs> mass extinctions, I guess, yeah. Hi, um, so you talked about how these meteor events um, occasionally do, but also uh, do not um, correlate with mass extinctions. Um, but there's a there's a greater correlation with these, uh, you know, apocalyptic lava flows. Uh, are there examples of times where uh, there have been you know huge lava events that haven't affected life on Earth, or at least not to the same extent? And in general, what um, what causes these you know yeah. huge lava events, and and how do they work? Uh, that's a great question, and um, yeah, I didn't want to overcomplicate things, but there is one. There's one. I think it's. 130 million years ago or so, called the Piranha Atendeca traps in South America, that are maybe as big as the ones associated with the mass extinctions. And it similarly doesn't seem like anything goes extinct. People have argued that maybe that's because it was over a longer time period, or maybe it was based on the rocks that they were going, coming through. Um, so that the Siberian traps we also know would have burned through uh, the world, one of the world's largest coal basins would have burned through all these carbon-rich rocks, and that would have been another way of getting a ton of CO2 in the air. And maybe if you're, if you're coming up through rock that isn't quite as filled with as many volatiles, then uh, you can't quite get to a mass extinction. Um, but that's definitely, a, definitely an active area of um, inquiry. Um, as to what causes them, that starts to get into some really uh, deep like geophysical questions. Uh, but there's sort of these theories, these things called mantle plumes, which are just, you know, the mantle's convecting, and then every once in a while you get this like big plume, like plastic blob that just emerges, um, just rocketing to the surface. Um, I know in the Triassic, they think that one of the sort of factors that might have made it easier for one of these things to happen is that as the continents are pulling apart, that the crust would have been weaker and it might have been a weak spot for one of these things to break through to the surface and be as catastrophic as it is. But yeah, why they happen, I, I don't really get into the book and I kind of just paper over that. <laughs> but it's, yeah, mantle plumes, I guess. Yeah. Although those still are theoretical. That's just people have modeled things like that, but no one has ever, I don't think, really found direct evidence of mantle plumes or anything. Although I might get in trouble for saying this stuff because I'm. 
everything in the book, I, I'm interviewing geologists and things. I'm a science journalist, so for me to have an opinion about this stuff is, I'm a little out of my depth in doing so, but um, I'm reporting what, what I take from these geological meetings and these interviews and reading these books, so. Thank you. Thanks, everyone coming.